Hi, welcome to the Sigma Path. In this episode, I have something absolutely incredible to show you. This is the Adjutant Resolve. Now, normally we talk about what the instrument is, what it does, but in this case, I think it deserves a demonstration first. Watch this. So consider the following situation. I have this mystery bottle. When I squeeze it, it feels kind of soft, so it's made of perhaps some type of plastic. When I shake it, there's definitely a powder inside, but the bottle is completely opaque. I cannot see inside of it at all. I can't even tell what color that powder is. But I do want to know what that powder is made of. What is this chemical composition? Is it dangerous? Now I want to figure it out without ever having to open the bottle. Because again, it could be dangerous and you may not even be allowed to open it in the first place. We can always x-ray the bottle. It tells us that there's something inside and a regular x-ray isn't going to really help us except that there's something inside the bottle. But let's make the situation even more complicated. We're going to take one of these shipping bags. We're going to dis take this bottle and we're going to put that bottle inside of the shipping bag. Now it is even more mysterious because now we have several different kinds of materials all on top of each other. This brown plastic is a totally different material than what that bottle was made of. Not to mention that we're still interested in the powder inside. So let's take this and scan it with our Agilean Roman Resolve and see what happens. I'm going to hold the sample here directly on top of the noise cone in the front of the instrument. We're going to select the thick colored or opaque sample because this indeed fits that criteria. We're going to select our laser power and then we're going to wait. It's going to take about a minute for the instrument to do the scan. Let's zoom in a little bit more on the display. I'm going to fast forward it a little bit on the parts that it takes a bit of time to do the measurement. So first it's going to check for ambient light, then it's going to do some initial measurement, and then it's going to do several different steps until it comes to the analysis. So here's the first batch of the scan. You can see there is some signal present. Another batch of measurements undergoing now. So the scan is done, and now it is processing. Let's see what it comes up with. It's a big database that it has to search through. And look at that. It says that it is potassium permanganate. But is it right? Is that really what's inside of that bottle? Well, we can take the bottle out, and indeed does have a label on the other side, and it is potassium permanganate. Isn't that incredible? I have done probably over 200 measurements using this instrument by now, and it still feels like a magic trick every time that I do an experiment with it. It really is an amazing thing. So how does it work? Well, if you stick with me through this video, by the end of this video, you will know exactly how this works. And not only that, we're going to do a whole bunch of experiments on what happens when photons interact with different material. There's a lot of really cool physical concepts and experiments ahead. Let's get going. Now by now you've probably guessed what we have is a Raman spectrometer. Now this particular unit has a few additional tricks that we will talk about. But we also need to talk about Raman himself. He was an extraordinary scientist. He had a fascination with scattering of light, particularly through liquids. When he was on a boat, he used to carry a spectrograph with him, made of prisms and so on, and used to look at the light coming from the surface of the water, that blue light, and try to figure out how that phenomenon happens. In his laboratory in Calcutta, India, he used to do experiments of shining light into different liquids and looking at the wavelength that was coming back. And he noticed that sometimes the wavelength coming out was not the same as what was going in. These measurements were difficult to do because he has to use colored filter lenses before and after the sample, and he was using sunlight. And for this phenomenon to take place, you need a lot of photons, you need a lot, very bright light source. He couldn't use a laser because it wasn't invented yet. He had to wait another 30 years just to have a laser on hand. So what he used to do is to take a telescope and use the optics in the telescope to shine the sunlight onto the sample to get as bright of a sample as possible. And this was the apparatus that he built. This is the first Raman spectrograph. Essentially, this phenomenon meant that when the light hit the sample, the light that was coming out of the sample had a shift in wavelength. And that shift had some correlation with the material property. Now the key here was that that shift was polarized, the light coming out was polarized, which distinguished it from fluorescence, and that was a major discovery. He published his findings in Nature, and this paper is titled as this Negative Absorption radi of Radiation, and here's a sample of his spectrograph measurement showing different lines coming out of the sample. And within a few years, pretty much everybody was using a Raman spectrometer to detect and figure out chemical compositions of materials. And in 1930, Raman did receive the Nobel Prize for his discovery, which changed the face of how we do a lot of these measurements. This is an extraordinary story on its own, and I believe uh, this event is actually a national holiday in India. 
So let's talk about some of these effects in a little bit more detail. Now imagine that we have an infrared source of light and we're going to shine photons onto a sample and we have the molecules in that sample sitting at the electronic ground state, E0. When those photons hit the sample, it is possible that the photon is completely absorbed by the sample. We observe this every day. In that situation, the molecules will move into a higher vibrational energy level and the photon is lost and that translates into a higher thermal energy and the temperature of the sample essentially goes up. Now, infrared Spectroscopy is a powerful tool in itself because by detecting how many photons are absorbed or what material is made of, it's going to have a different effect on that absorption. So you can tell what the material is partially through infrared absorption. Now most of the time when a photon hits a sample, it actually comes back. And that's how we essentially are able to observe the world. And this is called a Rayleigh scattering. This is an elastic scattering, meaning that the energy of the light going in and the energy of the light coming out is the same. Therefore, the wavelength is the same. So what happens is that the photon hits a molecule and it gets it to move beyond this electronic ground state into some virtually excited state. But this state is unstable. So immediately the molecule wants to jump back down to where it was and that difference in the energy is a photon that comes back out. And if you notice, these two energy levels are the same and therefore really scattering just simply brings the photon back to us. This is by far the most prominent way photons interact with material and that's why we don't see a shift because what goes in essentially comes back out. But every once in a while, what happens is that when a photon hits a sample and it goes into a virtually excited state, on its way down, it doesn't go all the way to where it started. It's, it remains at some vibrational energy level. So now the photon that leaves the sample is not the same energy as the photon that hit the sample. And the difference between those two is a Raman shift. And we call those lines, in this case, the Stoke lines. And this is where the energy coming out is less than the energy going in. It is also possible that the opposite happens. And if the sample already is in a vibrational energy level, some molecule is sitting here and it gets absorbs a photon, it goes all the way to another virtual excited state. On its way back down, it may jump down all the way to below where it started, to the electronic ground state. In that situation, the energy that it gives off is more than the energy it absorbed. And these are the anti-stoke lines sitting on the other side of the spectrum. Now, if I were to make an analogy to RF circuits, because we talk about RF a lot, this would be essentially like a mixer. So we have our LO, the local oscillator, being the photon that hits the sample. The IF signal in this case is the material property that causes that shift. And what comes back at us is the RF signal. It's either sitting at the lower sideband or the upper sideband, depending on whether it's the Stokes or anti-Stokes line. This is a very, very loose analogy, and the properties of RF circuits are vastly different than what happens here in a Raman phenomenon. But it's essentially what we're seeing. We're seeing a shift in wavelength versus what we put in and what we get out. Now, this Raman phenomenon is really, really weak, much, much, much weaker than Rayleigh. That's why it was so hard to detect, because the signal-to-noise ratio required to detect it is extraordinarily high, and there are tricks you have to be play in order to be able to detect this using modern electronics. Now, as if things were not hard enough, there is another complication, and that complication is fluorescence. Now, imagine a photon with high enough energy hitting the molecule again, but this time, the energy of the photon is high enough to move it from a vibrational energy level that's sitting above the ground state in a, into a much, much higher state that's even beyond the first electronic state, E1. So in that situation, the molecule is now sitting in some high vibrational energy state, slowly works its way down, and it jumps from electronic state E1 into above electronic state E0. In that situation, it releases a photon also. And that photon is the fluorescence effect. Unfortunately, this effect of fluorescence is much, much stronger, about a thousand to 10,000 times stronger than Raman itself. It is weaker than Rayleigh scattering, of course, but nonetheless, it is strong enough that it interferes directly with the Raman measurement. So then you might be tempted to say, well, wait a second, this energy coming from fluorescence is weaker than the photon energy we put in, which is the same as Stokes. So why don't we just use the anti-Stoke lines, because anti-Stoke lines sit on the opposite side of the fluorescence line. But unfortunately, there is another complication yet again. Anti-Stoke lines are much, much weaker than Stoke lines. And this has to do with some Boltzmann distribution of vibrational energy levels at room temperature. Essentially, it means that fewer molecules are sitting in this higher vibrational energy levels at room temperature. Therefore, anti-Stoke events happen much, much less frequency than Stoke events. So we can't use this at all. There are some Raman systems that do use it, but unfortunately, because of the sensitivity requirements, you're going to be stuck with Stokes. So which means that the Raman lines and fluorescence lines both sit on the same side of the Raman shift, and that is a problem. So then you say, well, why don't we just make the 
laser we use, the photon energy of the laser as weak as possible. In that situation, we just don't fluoresce, because if a material can fluoresce, it prefers to do that over ramen. But then there's another complication yet again. The efficiency of ramen itself scales with 1 over lambda to the power of 4. It means that you really want to make lambda small, go towards UV light. But if you go towards UV light, you really strengthen fluorescence. So yet you have to hit a compromise, a compromise of a laser wavelength that gives you some Raman effect strong enough but doesn't give you a lot of fluorescence. And in the case of the adjutant Raman Resolve, we're using about 830, 850 nanometer lasers in that situation is a great compromise in order to be able to avoid fluorescence as much as possible and get a good Raman signal. As you can see, this is a very complex situation with a lot of interesting and intricate interplay between these phenomena. So I want to show you fluorescence and, of course, Raman, but I also want to show you nonlinear optics and some of the other interesting things that happen, like how electrons can cause photon emissions. There's a whole bunch of experiments that I want to do, and then we'll get into playing around with the unit. Now let's see if we can observe some fluorescence. This is a helium cadmium laser running at 442 nanometer. I've done a complete teardown and explanation of how this laser works. You can watch it in a separate video. Right now we're just going to use it as a source of high energy photons. 442 nanometer is pretty close to UV. So we're going to get this nice energy photons and we can hit a sample, see if it can create fluorescence. The power supply of the laser is right there. It's been warmed up for some time, so we're definitely producing some nice laser beam. Let's take a look at it. So I want a sample for fluorescence that exhibits a very strong effect, but I also want it to have a big wavelength shift, so it's very obvious that it is fluorescing. So let's use uranium glass. Uranium glass has uranium oxide in it, which heavily fluoresces under UV light. Now the reason I want to use a laser for this is because as we talked about, the photon collisions with the molecules cause the fluorescence effect, and a converged beam of light coming from a laser allows you to see a concentrated effect of fluorescence rather than a scattered effect. I'll show you that too, but let's put some of these marbles in the path of the laser and see what happens. So let's try this out. The laser is on. I'm wearing goggles by the way, so here's the beam of light coming out. And let's put the marble there. And look at that. That is so cool. You can clearly see that the color of the laser looks very different as it travels through the glass. And that's the fluorescence effect of the uranium oxide that's present in the glass. And there's some defects inside of the marble that cause internal reflections. And you can see the beam of light as it refracts and breaks apart inside of the marble. Now this effect is really obvious because the wavelength shift is big and that's why I was choosing this material and clearly see that the light is changing color. Now we may be able to measure this wavelength shift. I'm going to try it, but you have to be very careful because you can damage your spectrometer when you do this. I have a spectrometer I'm going to use and that's actually one of the challenges of making ramen and we'll talk about that at the same time. By the way, you don't need a laser to see this effect if you don't mind flooding your sample with UV light. See all the marbles and here's a UV flashlight. Look at that. Clearly see fluorescence happening. Very strong, very big shift away from the actual wavelength of the light coming out. But the laser allows us to see that that only really happens in the path of the photons as to be expected. Now here's a liquid sample that will also fluoresce, and this is tonic water, and it has naturally occurring quinine in it, and that also fluoresces under light. But as you can see, the wavelength doesn't shift very much, and therefore is not as impressive when you look at it indirectly with your eyes. But indeed, you can clearly see that this is happening in the path of the photons too. And here's our setup for trying to capture the fluorescence effect. We have the marble here on a stand, laser going right through it, and we have the probe of our spectrometer, which is sitting right over here, sitting at a right angle strategically placed next to the marble. It's really important to not get that laser inside of that aperture, otherwise you will damage what's inside of the spectrometer, which I will discuss in details later on. And here's a close look at that marble and how that is sitting. Look at that. So. The fact that we can see that light coming out, the spectrometer should also be able to see it. So let's take a look and see what the actual result is. And here's our result. First of all, note how strong the laser signal still is, even though we're not directly shining into the spectrometer. In fact, it looks so white because it is saturating the nearby pixels in the CCD. And here's our fluorescence. You can clearly see the green that we were observing with our eyes. And this example is really nice because the difference between the laser and the color of the fluorescence is so white that it's easily observable even in this crude benched up setup. 
but this also demonstrates how hard it must be to make Raman measurements because you have to get rid of this laser. Not only that laser can damage the CCD, but it will also swamp out everything else that you're trying to measure. So you have this massive dynamic range you need to worry about. Now my laser power is fluctuating, so you can see the laser power is going down. Fluorescence is getting weaker, and also the line is narrowing because we're not saturating the CCD nearly as much as before. Now in a Raman, you need to get rid of this using optical methods. You cannot do it in electronics anymore, and that's typically either done with a kind of a band stop filter, which is really expensive in optics, or with some kind of a low-pass filter. But nonetheless, that needs to be completely eliminated if you have any hope of catching the Raman signature. This fluorescence is extraordinarily strong, and we're already having a difficulty. Imagine how tough it must be in the situation of Raman. So now we have a good idea of how this happens and roughly what kind of experiment results you would see in a Raman. It's just a lot easier to demonstrate using fluorescence. Now, even though fluorescence can interfere with Raman spectroscopy, it does have a lot of other applications. For example, in fluorescence microscopy. In those situations, you can have a dye that reacts at a particular wavelength and fluoresces at a very specific wavelength. You can add that dye to your biological sample, for example, like this and then it attaches itself to a particular part of a cellular structure or biological sample. And then when the UV light hits it, those parts glow and they become differentiated and much easier to see. So in this case, you would have to have a UV light on the microscope and the light travels this way. It hits the sample with the UV light, it fluoresces and on the way back up, it comes through the eyepiece and then you can observe it. And you can right away notice there are complications here too. You don't want that UV light to reach the user because it will be quite dangerous for your eye. And therefore there needs to be filters inside the microscope. In this example of this particular model, the filters come in these cubes. And here's an example of one. And what happens is that these cubes have different kinds of filters attached to them. So the UV light enters here and it gets filtered to the wavelength you want, hits the sample, and on the way back up, this filter filters out the UV but keeps the fluorescent li light that has shifted in wavelength intact, and that's what reaches the user. There are many different combinations of these filters and many different dyes that fluoresce at different wavelengths. It's a huge area of microscopy, and high-resolution microscopy even has received its own Nobel Prize. That's actually from Bell Labs. It's a very interesting area. But let's move on to something else. Let's talk a little bit about nonlinear optics. Now, even if you've never thought about nonlinear optics, it is likely that you have seen its effect if you've ever used a green laser pointer. And that's because these green laser pointers actually rely on a nonlinear crystal inside of the head of the laser. The actual laser module inside the semiconductor that produces the photon is in the infrared wavelength. And then there's a frequency doubling or essentially halving the wavelength that happens inside the crystal. But something doesn't quite add up here, because if you're going from a long wavelength to a short wavelength, you're actually increasing the photon energy. And that seems like it's violating some kind of law. But that's because every two photon at the longer wavelength produces one photon at the shorter wavelength. So there is no problem with conservation of that kind of energy. Now the reason these nonlinear things happen, in particular with frequency doubling, has to do with what happens in the electric field of the atomic structure of the crystals when they're hit with these multiple photons. We won't go into the details of that, but suffice to say that that nonlinear effect again is very similar to what happens in RF circuits. You have to create some nonlinear x to the power of 2 function in order to be able to double the frequency, and that's exactly what's going on. But I think we should take the crystal out of this so we can look at it under the microscope because it is very, very small. And there is a caveat with that. And if these things are not well built, there will be a lot of leakage of that fundamental wavelength going in, which is in infrared. And you can't see it. And it can be quite dangerous if these things are cheaply made because they're putting out a huge amount of infrared light to produce some green light as the process is not very efficient. So let's see if we can look at that crystal. And then we can even measure the wavelength of this and see how much a leakage there is actually in this one. And this is a really good laser pointer, so I don't expect a lot of it. And here's one of these nonlinear crystals that I took out of an inexpensive laser pointer, not the one I was showing you just a moment ago. And you can see that crystal inside and how tiny that crystal actually is. And there's some focusing lenses that go with it that you have to assemble very carefully on top of it. And that focuses the incoming infrared light directly on top of that crystal. Now you can imagine that if you don't have good manufacturing tolerances, you could miss that or it could be slightly misaligned, or if this glue isn't properly covering everything, you'd leak around it, and you get a lot of infrared photons escaping the nonlinear crystal, and that would be, of course, a problem. And this kind of manufacturing has become really common and inexpensive, and these laser pointers are available everywhere, on eBay and on Amazon and so on, without any really strict regulations. So always be very careful where you source your lasers. Now we can verify the presence of this infrared light by just shining our laser pointer on a piece of paper nearby. 
like this, and the reflection is enough for us to capture that. It's really important to never shine that laser inside of the aperture. Of course, you're going to damage the CCD. Let's take a look at the spectrum. And here's the spectral content without the laser. The shape that you see here is from the lights in the lab. And my lights are on the cooler side. That's why we see a strong blue presence here. These are 5,000 Kelvin LEDs. So I'm going to shine the laser now nearby and see what happens. There we go. Look at that. Now, we are already completely saturating the detector. But if you look on this side, there is a tone. And this tone is indeed at twice the wavelength, half the frequency of the main tone of the laser. As always, the tone get, becomes really white when the laser is really strong. That's normal, saturating the CCD. If I move it away, you can see we get that sh nice sharp tone, but then we barely can register that other wavelength that we were looking at before. So indeed, this thing does rely on frequency doubling. Now, there are other applications for nonlinear optics, and here's an example of human ingenuity once again. Imagine for a second that you have an optical pulse like this, and the optical pulse is extremely narrow. And I say narrow, I mean in the orders of a femtosecond. And I want to measure how wide that pulse is. Is it one femtosecond? Is it 10? Is it one pico? How would you measure it? Well, one way you could do it is to convert it to electrons, basically go through an optoelectric conversion. And then now you have an electronic version of that pulse, and then you want to measure its width. But right away, that runs into a huge number of problems. First of all, you need to be able to convert it to electrons at that bandwidth. Otherwise, the pulse would become wider. And then you still need to sample it in the electronic domain, which is a whole other problem. Now, if it's 30 years ago and you wanted to do this, you won't even have the electronics. So the problem is, is quite serious if you want to solve it. So what would you do in that case? Well, of course, you would build this device. This is an autocorrelator. So how that works is there is an aperture over here where the light can enter. And once the light enters the instrument, there is a splitting mirror here, which splits the signal into two paths. One path goes right through the mirror, hits this mirror, hits this one, this one, back into this one, back onto the mirror, goes through this focusing, and hits this device. This is a nonlinear crystal, which then generates second harmonics if there is enough photons. And there's a detector in here. So first path goes through, hits that, comes over here, comes back, comes over here, hits the crystal into the detector. And I can move that top crystal back and forth, which changes the time in which that pulse arrives at this crystal. Okay, so that's the first version. The second version goes through this guy, hits this mirror, but now goes this way. And when these guys are perfectly aligned right over here, it hits this mirror, this mirror, that one, back over here, back over here, and all the way here, and also hits this crystal. Now this thing can actually move, and it spins, and during a certain position here, right around this area, it changes the delay, the time it takes for the light to go forward and backward, a tiny amount of delay. And I can turn it on, you can see that it spins pretty quickly. So it's constantly applying that delay. Now because you have this mirror, you now have two copies of this pulse. So here's the first copy, and here's the second copy. Now these two copies, because of this delay, are constantly moving with respect to each other. Whenever they overlap, the two have now twice as many photons. And when they hit the crystal, you get a strong nonlinear effect. So basically, it means that you will see them when they're overlapping, but you will see a weaker effect when they're partially overlapping, and you see a very weak effect when they're not overlapping at all. And because you know the location of this, you know exactly when they're overlapping, by moving this mirror back and forth, and by looking at the position, you will know how long it took them to be overlapped. So if it's over here, fully overlapped, as they go away, less overlap, and by measuring that delay in time, in space, not in electronics, you will know exactly the width of the pulse. This is a genius instrument, and this autocorrelator has a lot of functions, not just in optics, but also in electronics. The concept of overlapping two pulses and looking at their nonlinear effects to a crystal is just genius. So this is a subject of a different video, but I did want to show you that we have this kind of instruments to do nonlinear effect measurements too. And there's one other small topic I want to mention, and it is excitation of different materials using electrons. It is possible to hit electrons onto something and have the atoms get excited, or the electrons within the orbits of the atoms to move on to higher states. And then upon returning, they will also release photons of particular wavelengths. In fact, the discovery that electrons had quantized orbits around atoms was a major thing, and it meant that we could distinguish and differentiate different gases by the emissions of photons they have under this excitation mode. So let's try that here with a mini Tesla coil. I'm going to plug this in. You have to keep this away from all the other sensitive instruments in the lab, of course, for obvious reasons. And we can excite gases like helium. You, go, you can clearly see the glow coming from the excitation of the gas trapped inside of the vial. And we can excite something like neon, and we would expect a characteristic red glow in some areas of the tube, and that's exactly what we see. 
and that is a characteristic of neon that's how you get a neon tube generally to have that red glow so this is a very different phenomenon than fluorescence and I want to make sure there's no confusion so by now we have a good idea of what physical phenomenon we're looking for and what components we need to build an instrument like this now one of the very first things we need is of course a laser and it's not just any laser it has to be a really well stabilized laser now, I've talked about stabilizing semiconductor lasers on the channel extensively before so I won't go into too much detail but we've looked at a laser source like this this is a semiconductor laser in the infrared and there's a thermoelectric cooler in here and even a wavelength measurement device in order to be able to stabilize this laser to a very specific and, and constant wavelength and we definitely need some of that inside of this because otherwise we won't be able to know what our incident photon wavelengths are and therefore the Raman shift will become meaningless but let's say we build the laser and that's inside of this that's already hard enough to do but then we also need some kind of a spectrometer so this also needs to be inside of this now how do we build this and there are many ways to do this let's take a look at some of the architectures and here's an example of a monochromator. Now, as far as I know, Raman used the prism to separate the different wavelengths, and the prism uses refractive index of the material to separate different wavelengths that are hitting it, and it bends lights in a different direction. Now, we have much more interesting ways and much more precise ways of doing that. We can use a grading mirror. A grading mirror has finely spaced lines, and it uses constructive and destructive interference patterns to create this separation of wavelength. A diffraction mirror is essentially a Fourier transform in space and allows us to separate the different wavelengths so that we can shine them into a different spatial location. It's a very clever idea. It's been around for a very long time. And it makes these kind of measurements a lot easier. So what is a monochromator? Well, in the case of a monochromator, a light enters in one here, hits this mirror, hits our grading mirror over there. You can see if I shine some light on it, you can see the rainbow pattern appear around. So there's definitely one of those diffraction mirrors inside. And then that hits this mirror, and it hits this one, and it goes inside of the photomultiplier tube. So this has some advantages and some disadvantages. First of all, a photomultiplier tube is not solid state, but it has extraordinary high sensitivity. A photon enters the tube, hits a plate, converts it to an electron, and the electron is accelerated by a very strong electric field, thousands of volts. And it hits another plate and another plate, and every time it hits a plate, it multiplies, and therefore the term photomultiplier tube. So you can even capture a single photon and create enough electrons to detect it electronically. So very high sensitivity. But the problem is that because there is only one detector, you have to change the angle of your diffraction grading mirror in order to measure the different wavelengths. So you have to basically constantly adjust this. And depending on the location you're in, you're going to get a different angle to the detector, and therefore you're looking at a different wavelength. So you can only measure one wavelength at a time, therefore it's called a monochromator. But it is very, very sensitive but it's slow and it requires mechanical movement. So that's not what's done inside of our uh, Raman spectrometer. We have to use a completely non-moving solid state circuits. And here is what's inside of my very inexpensive spectrometer. Everything is exactly the same as a monochromator, except for the fact that we have replaced our photomultiplier tube detector with a CCD array, which sits right over here. So the light enters here, it hits this mirror, then it hits our grading mirror. This is a grading diffraction mirror. You can kind of see the light spread there. Then it hits this mirror and it shines across the linear CCD detector. So here we have a linear CCD detector. You can see there's some filters in front of it. And by the way, a CCD was also the recipient of a Nobel Prize, also invented at Bell Labs. So in this situation, we don't have any moving parts. The CCD just simply gets the Fourier transform in space projected onto it. So every location of the CCD then translates into a different wavelength. And that's how you build a spectrometer. Pretty straightforward when you think about it. Now you can make this quite a bit more interesting and more complicated. Now it turns out that most semiconductor materials and CCDs included generate what's called a dark current, which means that when there is no photon hitting it, they're still creating some stray current. That's noise, and that limits the minimum detectable photon signal that arrives at it. So what can you do to avoid that? Well, one thing you can do is to cool it. So if I attach a thermoelectric cooler to the back of this, I can bring it well below ambient temperature. And that increases its sen sensitivity significantly because it reduces a dark current. But that has its own challenges. As soon as you cool it, you're going to get condensation. So they have to encapsulate this whole thing in a quartz crystal glass container. And in that case, they will fill it with helium or the nitrogen. And then when you chill it down, they won't get condensation. All of that is actually inside of our spectrometer because there is a thermoelectric cooler on the laser and there is a thermoelectric cooler on the CCD detector to improve its noise performance. So that's a lot of stuff to cram into that tiny little space, but that's what it takes if you want to have a portable Raman spectrometer like the one we have. But the principle of operation is exactly the same.
And now we have the background and all the challenges associated with building a Raman spectrometer. And here is a block diagram of what our unit looks like. So we have the sample that we're interested in measuring. We have our laser, in this case, in the 800 to 850 nanometer wavelength, infrared. And that hits our sample. And that light coming back now contains the information of the Raman, as well as, of course, the Rayleigh scattering of our laser too, which is very strong. We focus that and we filter this, and this is crucial because we want to get rid of the laser wavelength as much as possible. And then we refocus that again, we pass that through a slit, which is now inside of the spectrometer, and this slit determines the resolution and some of the other properties of the spectrometer. And then once it gets into the collimating mirror, it hits our grading mirror, just like we saw in the unit that I was showing you, and that creates a special Fourier transform separating all the wavelengths into a different spatial location, and then we focus that onto a CCD detector. And the CCD detector then tells us the exact spectrum of the signal coming back. And from that spectrum, we get what's called a fingerprint of that particular chemical. And as we talked about from the Raman phenomenon itself, different chemicals have different fingerprints and different Raman shift. And we put all of that together, and if we have an extensive library of these chemical signatures, which is what's inside of the unit 2, I'll talk about that in a second, we can then reverse that and find out what chemical we were using. And that's the entire process. Now, if you look at this, you say, well, that's great, but there's one thing that's still not explained. How does our Raman spectrometer know what's inside of the container rather than what the outside of the container is made of? Because if you scan the container, you're not just going to get the Raman signature of what's inside. You're also going to get the Raman signature of all the materials the container is made of, different plastics and different glasses that it may be made of. That's also going to be there. So how do we separate that information? Well, that's a whole other issue, which I will explain next. And that's one of the reasons why the laser and the focusing path of the Raman are actually in two different locations. So they're not coming from the same aperture. So let's talk about that technique. And this technique is called spatially offset Raman spectroscopy, or SORS. It's actually a fairly recent developed technique. And as the name suggests, it involves some kind of offset measurement. So imagine we have a container. And this container body is made of some material. In this example, HDPE is the material it is made of. And so let's say something's inside the container. In this example, hydrogen peroxide. Now, what I can do is I can first take one Raman measurement. And that Raman measurement, I have an incident laser hitting the container, and I use the detector to capture that signal. And then I will move my laser, and I will make another measurement. And because the incident angle of the laser is now different, I will penetrate deeper into the material, and I will also get the signature of what's inside. And this example, therefore, means you have to subtract the result of these multiple different angles at a appropriate scaling in order to be able to find what was inside the container versus what was the actual container made of. In this case, you can see the reference Raman signature of HDP, which is the material of the container. Here's the backscatter we actually get. And if you subtract and scale them, you'll end up with the SORS result, which matches H2O2, which is a reference material we're interested in, the hydrogen peroxide inside of the container. And this technique can be quite powerful, even for things that are really opaque. Here's another example of that. Here's the zero offset measurement, specially offset measurement, and we slowly do a scale factor, and we get a perfect match to what's inside. So it sounds really simple, of course, but there's some really clever optics and, of course, signal processing involved to get something like this done. And the collection of these technologies makes the Agilent Resolve one of the most advanced handheld Raman spectrometers with SORS capability, making it possible to look through a variety of opaque materials and identify what's inside of them. This obviously makes this much more versatile and significantly safer to use in the field as you may not know what material you're coming across. And it's just overall makes things a lot simpler. And the GUI is designed to be really straightforward, basically usable by anyone, even if you have absolutely no knowledge of how this instrument works. But as I promised, if you're stuck to this point, hopefully you now know exactly how this instrument works. Now the fun part. Let's go do a whole bunch of material identification and try a different features this instrument has. Now depending on the sample you're measuring and the environment you're in, the Agilent Resolve offers a few different measurement configuration. So here's the main aperture of the instrument. Now keep in mind that the laser and the collection in the spectrometer come from two separate points inside. The entire thing is covered with glass. And actually, the entire instrument is essentially waterproof. So in theory, you could make Raman measurements underwater, though I haven't tried that yet. And because these two points are separated, without anything connected to the front of the unit, the instrument will project two red laser pointer dots. And as you adjust the distance, they will essentially focus onto one point, and that helps you find the nominal distance between the sample and the front of the instrument, which is very helpful. 
Now, most of the time, you probably want to have the main nose cone connected. You can see it does have two openings, one for the laser, one for the spectrometer collection, and it gives you these guidance so that you can get the best measurement possible. Not only does this help make sure the laser doesn't go anywhere else because it is a high-power laser, it also prevents any stray light coming in. And this is a metallic piece, fairly inert, which means that if it ever comes in contact with one of your samples, you can easily clean it. And that's quite helpful because it can be removed and cleaned and it's magnetically attached to the front of the instrument. Now, on top of that, you have, of course, the protective cap as well, but this is more than just a cap. Inside of it, we do have a Teflon cover, and that Teflon cover gives you a very good Raman signature. So the instrument uses this Teflon to calibrate and to ensure that everything is up to speed and it is actually working correctly, which is very helpful too. Now, if you have a sample you can collect in a vial, which can be helpful if you really want to separate everything else from the environment and get a really precise, high-sensitivity measurement, you can put it inside of this vial holder, which itself is magnetically attached. You can see it has a very similar profile to the back of this. And by putting the vial in there, you can see it kind of goes right there inside. It gives you a really nice measurement. You can close it. And this way, the laser is entirely confined within that space. And that helps a lot to get a really good signature. So we'll use all these different things for the different measurements I have in mind. And here's the close-up of the aperture. You can see the collection lens on the right side and laser apertures on the left. Now, we did talk about that in SORS mode, this instrument needs to be able to change the angle incident of the laser coming in. So there has to be some moving parts inside. Now, you don't want to run it and look inside of it, obviously, because it is producing a very high power invisible laser radiation, half a watt, so you definitely don't want to look at it. However, I can run a diagnostic, and there it is, look at that. You can see that moving part, which is precisely controlled and precisely tracked. And the instrument actually tells you very accurately the exact location of that in order to be able to do that computation I showed you, in order to be able to tell what's inside the container versus the container itself. And here's the setup we're going to use to characterize a bunch of different materials and familiarize ourselves with the instrument. On the left, I have here a live view of the camera, so you can see exactly what I'm doing with the instrument. And on the right side, we have a direct wireless connection into the instrument itself, so you can see a live view of the GUI. And that way we can see how we navigate through the different menus. Now, after a late night party at the signal path, there is some mystery powder left here on the table. And we'd like to find out what this powder is and whether it's dangerous and how it should be handled. There's no particular characteristic about this powder aside the fact that it is white. So let's go ahead and try and measure that. Now, we could remove the instrument and just point it directly at the sample using the nose cone that's installed. Or we could just take a piece of tape and try and remove some of the sample. Okay, so let's go ahead and remove that. There's a nose cone there. The unit has already gone through the calibration. And I have some tape here. And we can use the tape to just pick up some of this powder. Use this sticky side of the tape. And once we have enough of that powder onto the tape, we can attach that to the front of the unit. Now, there should be enough material here for this instrument to be able to characterize it. Now we can perform a scan. Now this is going to be a surface scan because there is no other material between our laser and detector and what it is that we are interested in. That's going to be a much quicker scan as SORS is not needed. The nose cone is on and the tape is over it. So I'm going to go ahead and choose the scan. And I'm going to use the highest laser power because we do have a very small amount of material and I want to get a good signal from it. Now once we select that, we're going to get the background light check here, which is normal. And then once it starts doing the measurement, we should be able to see the laser spot here on this tape because the camera is sensitive to IR, even though I cannot see it. We should hopefully be able to see that. There it is. There's the signal right there. And notice how that spot is big. And the reason is because they need to make sure that they don't heat up the material a lot in case it's explosive. So they have found a balance between a spot size and the intensity of the laser to still get a good enough signal for Raman measurement. And that's a delicate balance, but the safety here is crucial because in case this is explosive. And we are getting some signal here, which is nice. It's going to do, this is a final measurement. And now it's going to just simply search the library. You can see how much faster this measurement is because it doesn't need to do any of those offset measurements. There it is. And look at that. It is pseudofedrin. And it tells us that pseudofedrin is a control substance, and it of course is, with an 88% confidence of the match. Now, if I select that first highest match, it tells me the signal that has come back versus the library. It's a very close match, and that's what 88% is. Now, this sample is not pure pseudofedrin. There are other things in it. I'll tell you that in a second. But we can look at its baseline measurement. We can see the raw measurement. And if this was an SORS measurement, you will also be able to see the offset measurement. Now, if I further select that, it's going to tell me everything about pseudofedrin, what it is, where it comes from, what are the instructions on handling it, why it is, for example, controlled substance, safety measurements, and so on and on, which are very useful, especially if you know nothing about the material that it is that you're scanning. Now, if I go back, I can also see other results which are close enough that could be potentially another match. 
And if I click on that, I will see a long list of everything else that is in there. Many of these materials are very, very close to pseudoephedrine, and that's why the, the match is so high. Now, you may ask why I have pseudoephedrine powder. Well, that's actually just allergy medication. And allergy medication does have pseudoephedrine. That's one of the reasons it works. And here, at least where I live, you do need a driver license to purchase this, as it is a controlled substance. So you can only have a little bit of it at a time, which makes sense. So what if we have a mystery liquid spill? So here's some liquid here, right over there you can see. We don't know what it is. Of course, we don't want to touch it. And we can, again, either scan it or we can just get a Q-tip like this one and dip the Q-tip in there and have some of that liquid attached to the Q-tip. Now we can remove the nose cone by telling the instrument that we no longer have the nose cone. You can see it removes that over there. And there's some laser marks over here. There's one there, one there. And as you get closer to there, those two laser points converge into one point, And that's where you should be holding your sample. So I'm going to use some, something to hold it so I don't move it around too much and then we can do another scan. Okay, let's scan that. Now it's really important to wear goggles as I am. This is, this is a high power laser and normally you want to cover that in this situation, but for the sake of filming I have left it uncovered here. Okay, so it's going to go through exactly the same procedure and we do have a good signal which is nice. So we could have probably used even a lower laser level and it would have been fine. Normally you want to start from a low laser to a high laser. You don't have to start from the highest value every time. And the material is glycerin with a 98% confidence, and that is absolutely correct because that's where I got this from. Here's the bottle this came from, glycerin. So yeah, I just spilled a little bit of it on the table. Glycerin is quite safe, so it's not an issue, but you can see how easy it is and how high level of confidence we have here that this material is glycerin. If I look at the spectrum over here, we can see that it is a very, very close match, 98%, pretty good. So now let's try something that we have to use through barrier for. I have two containers here, one labeled alcohol, the other one acetone. Now, unfortunately, one day when I was topping these off, I accidentally added acetone to the alcohol container and alcohol to the acetone container. And as a result, both of these are now a mixture of both of these liquids. Now, they're both transparent and, of course, impossible to separate at this point anymore. But let's see if we can confuse the hydrogen rum and resolve and see if we can figure out that these are actually a mixture while they're inside of the container. So let's go ahead and scan this one. Put it directly in front of the nose cone. The nose cone is installed, as it shows here in the instrument menu. We're going to scan it. Now we can start from a very low laser power. In this case, the lowest one it has. And let's see what it does. This is a fairly transparent container, so it should be okay. And here are the offset measurements with some reasonable signal quality. And look at that. It has no issue telling us that this is a mixture of both of these compounds. So it's a lesson to never trust the labels alone, as there could be a mixture you would never know. And of course, acetone is quite a bit more dangerous in many ways, and it's a very aggressive solvent and can damage a lot of surfaces. So it's good to know that the instrument has no problem telling us what it is while it is inside of the container. Now here's a really difficult example, mystery liquid in a brown glass container. These containers are specifically designed to block out light. That's why the color choice is made and therefore makes it very tough to make Raman measurements. You need very high sensitivity. So let's try that directly in front of the instrument in exactly the same way. And this time we will choose a higher laser power considering the container we are in. I'm going to allow it to do the same measurement. And let's see if it succeeds in this case. And look at that, 96% confidence that this is indeed nitric acid, and it is nitric acid. And nitric acid is quite dangerous, it's good that we didn't open this container, especially fuming nitric acid can be quite harmful for your lungs if you're not around something like a fume hood. And here we can get more information about this particular material, of course, and further information about how to handle it, just like before, and its chemical composition, and, and so on. The instrument comes with an extensive set of libraries, things like toxic and hazardous materials, narcotics, explosives, and of course a whole bunch of just general chemicals. Now there is one library that this unit does not have, and that's the Chemical Warfare Agent Library, which is strictly internationally controlled for obvious reasons. Now you can search through the library and look at all the chemicals and get all the information, and in this case we have 13,145 elements in there, which is a huge library of course. And it con constantly grows every six months, I believe. There's a new revision of the library as various other chemicals that enter the market or various other narcotics that enter the market have to be added to this so that it can be used in appropriate places. Now, if you happen to scan something that's not in the library, you have two options. You can add that to the library. This, of course, doesn't identify the chemical, but it allows you to detect it again if you come across it in the future. This can be useful if there's something unknown you just want to keep track of. But if you really want to understand what it is made of and do a further analysis, there is a reach back function here, which allows you to send the spectrum back to Hydrogen and create a link with their scientists and engineers in the lab with much more sophisticated Raman spectrometers. And then that way they can figure out if they can identify that for you and then potentially add it to the library in the future.
So here I have prepared some samples, and we're going to take a look at them and see what the instrument says. Now, first one should be fairly familiar. These are Advil pills, and they're already inside the casing where the pill is actually made of. The liquid inside is what the active ingredient is. So let's put that in there and see what this instrument is going to report for that. We can scan this with the high laser power and see what it says. And look at that, it does tell us that it is ibuprofen, among a few other things, and those are most likely what the ibuprofen is soluble in, as well as the casing of the pill itself. But ibuprofen is the correct answer. And how about some mystery brown liquid? Let's try that in exactly the same way. And there it is, it tells us that it is ethanol as the primary ingredient, and that's because that is beer. And of course, ethanol is an alcohol content, and it's not a very high concentration, it's about 4 or 5 percent, but it does detect that, and it does detect a whole bunch of other things, which are other chemicals that are going to be present in the beer. I'm not sure about coconut milk, though, but I think some of those signatures are quite close in a glass vial, and that's probably why it is reporting those. So let's try these crystals, some off-pink color crystals. Let's try that one in the vial as well. And it returns clear glass, as if the compound inside is actually invisible to the instrument. And this is Himalayan salt, and salt very famously does not have a Raman signature. Now sometimes in these cases it's more important to know what something is not rather than what it is. Therefore you can rule out some of the known dangerous chemicals or illegal chemicals, for example. But it's interesting that some of the bonds in the uh, salt actually do not produce any Raman signature. Now the rest of the material that gives it a pink color, some iodine and some of the impurities, are not sufficient to clear to have a good Raman signature, at least not at this laser power. Let's try another perfectly white mystery powder. And here we have a very high confidence that this is acetaminophen, which is correct. That's exactly what this is. These are also some crushed pills. If you look at the spectrum here, we should see a very close match, and it indeed is almost exactly one to one. So very good signature from acetaminophen. This is a known fact. Let's try another liquid. So here's a liquid in a vial. It's almost clear, doesn't have any particular characteristics, and it's giving us a 98% confidence that this is zinc sulfate, and that's exactly it. I took some zinc sulfate powder and I dissolved it in water, and that's what we're getting. There's also some additional impurities because I was doing some experiments with it, but it is indeed correct. Very impressive. How about one more mystery white powder? This one does have some particles, blue particles in it, and it returns with 98% accuracy this compound of sodium, which I can't quite pronounce, and this is naproxen. And indeed, this is the active ingredient in naproxen. Naproxen is an anti-inflammatory medica medication that I have here also crushed into a powder that we can measure. And finally, let's try this liquid, somewhat greenish liquid in here. And here's an example when no signal is actually detected. So if you look at the signal that is returned, you can see there's essentially noise here, so we don't have a clear signature. Now this is lemon juice, which is primarily citric acid. I'm surprised that there's no signature for citric acid, but I guess there's no nothing to be found. But in this situation, if you're really unsure, you could always send this spectrum back to, to Agent for analysis. But generally the system knows whether there is a signature and no match versus when there is no signal at all. So in this case, the instrument says there is no signal. So I like to do some sensitivity measurements. So here in this vial, I have about 2 gram of acetone. And I'm going to add slowly to it some isopropyl alcohol and see at what point does the instrument detect that we actually have a mixture rather than just pure acetone. Now this on its own clearly registers acetone with almost 100% certainty, so we know that that is a pure sample. So let's go ahead and try it and add a little bit at a time and see what happens. Okay, so I added 0.1 gram of isopropyl alcohol to this mixture. Now we're going to measure that mixture and see what it gives us. Well, the primary ingredient is definitely acetone, and it tells us it has a very strong confidence in that, but it does say there's more matches. Let's see what it detects, and the more matches, and look at that. It does tell us that there is some isopropyl alcohol in there, which is really quite impressive in a tiny, minuscule presence of the substance. Now, to measure the sensitivity, of a Raman spectrometer, you need really sophisticated instrumentation. I'm not doing it justice here, but I did want to point out how sensitive a handheld instrument like this can actually be, even detecting minute amount of impurities present in something. So very interesting. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this extensive look at the science and operation of the Agilent Raman Resolve. So many Nobel Prizes inside of this one box alone. It's an extraordinary thing. And that mystery and magic at the beginning is now this awe of understanding and appreciation of the science, which is the foundation of education, and I really value that. 
I also want to sincerely thank Dr. Robert Stokes and Dr. Anna Blanco, who are part of the Agile Resolve team, for making this happen. They spend a lot of their own time working and helping to get this into my hand. It's not easy to get one of these instruments into a civilian's hand, especially with the libraries that are included, and I'm really grateful. They themselves are scientists at heart and really wanted to make sure that we demystify this technology and inspire other people to be able to understand how this works and want to be involved in a field like this. So send them some love in the comment section and let me know what you thought about the video in the comment section and if you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed making it. This was a lot of fun. If you have any questions, let me know and I'll try to answer it the best I can. See you next time.